biggest news to anybody in the room that the landscape of America is changing dramatically, especially within just the last decade. You know where you would used to drive down the road, you'd see billboards that are advertising family businesses. Today we see billboards that are advertising atheism. This one says atheism, a, a personal relationship with reality. We see buses rolling by that talk about there's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. In fact, in Minnesota, there's an entire campaign targeting young children. It says, please don't indoctrinate me with religion. Teach me to think for myself. In fact, there is a nationwide campaign going on where atheists have put up their words saying that all religions are fairy tales. I say all that to make sure that everybody in here understands our children and grandchildren are growing up in a totally different environment than we did. Just kind of as an example, you go back to the, the March 2006 issue of Discover Magazine. It was on the, the topic of unintelligent design. Now, those of you who follow the creation evolution debate, you know that the word design has basically become taboo among evolutionists, because if you've got design, that means you've also got a designer. In this particular issue, they are reporting that all life evolved from virus particles. Take a look at what the authors say. Now there's news for intelligent designers and the rest of us to ponder. We humans and all life on Earth may have well evolved from the most unintelligent entities one can imagine. Genetic shards that do nothing but copy themselves. We are nobody's great idea. We are the fortunate mistakes of countless biochemical morons. That's evolution. It's humbling, but somehow comforting. Now, I don't know about you this evening. I don't find that very comforting. But the reality of it is, if you really look at the evidence, folks, there's only two possible options. Either there really is a God, and you're here for a purpose, for a reason, you're created in His image, or you're just the fortunate mistake of countless biochemical morons. You're just the result of, of atoms colliding together in the galaxy. Now, as you look at those two opposing worldviews, I want you to ask yourself just one simple question. Which one of these is being actively taught in the textbooks today? Now, you, you don't have to answer the question. I actually brought some of the textbooks with me. For instance, this one says, humans probably evolved from bacteria that lived more than 4 billion years ago. Or how about this one, put out by Prentice Hall. It talks about humans evolving from ape-like creatures. In fact, it says, like all other forms of life, humans are products of evolution by natural selection. Or what about this one? To a biology book put out by Arms and Camp. Notice what I highlighted. It says, by the seventh month, the fetus looks from the outside like a tiny normal baby. But it's not. Okay, folks, let's ask yourself, why would we be teaching our young people that a seven-month-old in the womb is not a human child? Furthermore, take a look at what I call the evil of marketing. Look at the picture associated with that statement. Any lady in this room who's ever given birth will quickly tell you, that's not a seven-month-old, is it? Because by seven months, that child's doing aerobics in the womb. And yet, if they can get our kids to associate that picture with that statement, it does two things. Number one, it helps to devalue human life. And number two, it makes it a whole lot easier to abort, doesn't it? And right about now, many of you are kind of looking at me going, yeah, okay, yeah, but that, that's just science books. And that, that doesn't really affect me. It, it, it doesn't affect, doesn't affect Waterbury at all. You know, it doesn't affect our religious beliefs. Well, let's look a little bit deeper. Like, for instance, a, a more updated science book. Copyright 2012. This is a chapter on genetics evolution. It's got the normal evolutionary propaganda that I'm used to. Very first sentence says, although all living creatures ultimately share common ancestry, they come to differ from one another through a process of evolution. I expect that. 
But what you might not expect is at the top of the very next page. Take a look. It says, the mythology of most peoples includes a story explaining the appearance of humans on earth. The account of creation recorded in Genesis in the Bible, for example, explains human origins. What are they chalking it up as? A myth. In that same chapter, they got a picture of the Tower of Babel. It says the unfinished Tower of Babel described in the first book of the Bible symbolizes an ancient West Asian myth about the origins of language diversity. Folks, what I want you to understand is they're no longer concerned with just indoctrinating our kids with a godless theory. At this point, they're now actively trying to undermine their faith. In fact, remember, this is a textbook on science, genetics, right? And yet in that same chapter, it says, for instance, in traditional Christian religions, believers speak of God as a father who had a divine son, but do not entertain thoughts of God as a mother or a divine daughter. Goes on to say, such male privileging religions. You see, in the year 2014, there is a bullseye on Christianity. In fact, I would go so far as to say it is probably the most discriminated religion in America today. Here's the interesting thing. Can you imagine if somebody put that statement talking about Islam? Which, by the way, is a whole lot more male privileging. Folks, here's the problem. By the time your kids get to 7th, 8th, ninth grade, they've already bought into the lie. And in fact, usually by the age of 5, they've already been indoctrinated into evolution. The reason that I say that with such confidence is because there's not too many five-year-olds who are not absolutely enthralled with the dinosaurs. Kids love them. I mean, think about it for just a minute. They, they learn their names. They, they have those little plastic figurines. I, I tell parents, if you've never stepped on one of those in the middle of the night, you're not qualified as a parent yet. <laughs> My second son, when, when he was just two years of age, for the life of him, he could not say the word apple juice. It was always with a Z. It was apple juice. But he could rattle off dinosaur names like no place business. We, we'd sit on the couch and, and have one of those big picture books. We'd be flipping through and he'd say, Dad, look, there's an, a Panasaurus, a Brachiosaurus, a, a Spinosaurus, a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Could you give me some apple juice? <laughs> Kids love them. But it's not just children that love them. We adults also have a fascination with them. And as such, magazines, they are quick to put their picture on the cover because they know that when they do that, they're almost guaranteed increased sales. So what do they do? They tell us about, for instance, where they think they live or, or, or where they were discovered, what they think they look like how big they were. In fact, up until about three months ago, the largest dinosaur ever discovered was a creature called the Argentinosaurus. 110 tons is what they estimated this guy. He now second place. If you want to see a replica of this guy right here, you've got to go all the way to Atlanta, Georgia, to the Fernbank Museum, where... That replica stretches literally from one end of the museum all the way to the other. Now, to give you an idea of just how big this guy is, if you look at the screen, look on the right side, that's a full-size T-Rex. It doesn't come up to this guy's hip bone. This thing was massive. But folks, it's because of these same dinosaurs that we're losing a lot of our kids. Because think about it for just a moment. How many people are harmonizing the Bible with dinosaurs? And our kids, they've got all kinds of questions. They grow up learning about them. In fact, here's what I want to do. I, I want to walk through the life of maybe your child, your grandchild, someone, someone here in Waterbury. We'll start about age three, age four. You know, we, we buy those 
those toys, we, we get games, we get all kinds of figurines, we fill our houses up with, with all kinds of dinosaur paraphernalia. So already by age three or four, they're learning their names, they're learning all about them. They get a little older. Maybe age five. It's October in Connecticut. Kind of chilly outside, so, so there's mom, she's over, she's stirring up some instant oatmeal. All the while, the child is reading the package and learning about evolution. They hit age six. Now they're eating all the time. They want snacks all the time. So what do we do? We buy them snacks. And they learn about evolution. They hit age seven. Finally old enough to, to take them out to a fine dining establishment. So we load them up in the car. We take them somewhere really nice like Wendy's. <laughs> in fact, we go through the drive-thru. Here's the thing. They're sitting in the back of the car, eating their chicken nuggets, learning about what? Evolution. Or maybe your child doesn't like Wendy's. Maybe they like Arby's instead. And so again, they get indoctrinated with this godless theory. They get a little bit older. They start taking field trips to local museums, maybe in, in Hartford, where they learn these vast old ages. Or maybe they run over to something like the Smithsonian in D.C. Or maybe they go down to Atlanta, to that firm bank. Or, or maybe they go to Chicago, where Sue is on display. Now, take a look at that photo for just a moment. And I want you to ask yourself, how many of the parents of those kids do you think actually thought about what they would be reading on those placards when they signed that permission slip. Because I took that picture. And I also took a picture of what they're reading on those placards. And folks, listen to me. There's no way to harmonize what they're reading with God's Word. They get a little older. Now they're 10, 11. They're reading chapter books like, for instance, the Magic School Bus. Let, let's do a real quick experiment. How many folks in this room are familiar with the Magic School Bus? Let me see your hands real high. Oh, we got some older readers. <laughs> very, very popular kid series. Notice this. You open this particular book up. It's got a picture of a dinosaur chasing a caveman. But notice what it says. This story is make-believe. His friend says, yeah, there were no dinosaurs in the time of cave people. In fact, the top left-hand corner says... No people ever saw a dinosaur. When early humans appeared on the earth, dinosaurs had already been dead for millions of years. People found out about dinosaurs from fossils. Or maybe the child likes the Magic Treehouse, another very popular kid series. It's interesting, in this one, you don't even get into the book yet before you're hit with it. You're still in the introduction reading about these things being millions of years old, and then notice this, they throw in the line, human beings, of course, had not yet what? Evolved. Right in the middle of the book, they've got that timeline. Dinosaurs living in the Triassic, the Jurassic period. Finally, humans coming in at the tail end. Your child hits 12, 13, now they're taking science classes. They're taking biology. In one semester, maybe they take botany, they learn about plants, and, and one semester they come home, they've got a, a textbook called Evolution Change Over Time. Now, ask yourself this simple question. Do you think that they might use dinosaurs in a textbook like this to teach evolution? Like, if we were to open this textbook up, would we find information or, or pictures of dinosaurs? Like, for instance, on page 10, page 16, page 25, page 28, page 29, page 36, page 38, page 39, page 46, page 66, page 96, 97, 98, 99. In fact, in a 100-page textbook, a third of them have some kind of information about dinosaurs on 
Now, just to make sure everybody in this room understands what the real dilemma is. Right now, the textbooks are teaching our young people that dinosaurs died out roughly 65 million years ago. And then we came along carrying our clubs roughly 3 million years ago. That's not what the Bible teaches. And in fact, those of you who are familiar with the Bible, you know that in the very first chapter, it talks about there being a six-day creation. And if I were to ask you, what day were all land-dwelling creatures create, created on? Some of you could get it. It's day six. If I follow that question up by simply asking you, okay, what day was man created on? Day six. Folks, listen to me. If the Bible is true, and we're going to prove that it is, they would have had to coexist. Now, I, I realize for some of you in here, you're thinking there's no possible way. That's crazy. Dinosaurs lived a long time ago. Well, let me point out to you, you've been effect, effectively evolutionized. They, they've done a great job at convincing you and I'm going to look at some different evidence. Evidence maybe that you've never seen either in a textbook or, or from CNN. The question is not, did they exist? Because we know they did. We have found their fossilized remains on all seven continents. Arctic to Antarctic and everywhere in between. In fact, I was talking to a buddy of mine about four months ago. He had just gotten back from Antarctica. Guess what they found? Dinosaur fossils. I was getting off a plane a couple of months ago from Oregon. And a preacher buddy called me. He said, hey, Brad, we need you to come to our church. I thought he meant to speak. He said, no, no. He said, we got bones. <laughs> Thinking, what do those people do? <laughs> sure enough, I showed up. <laughs> they were building an addition onto their building. They were digging an elevator shaft. In the bottom of that elevator shaft, there were all kinds of dinosaur bones. We spent hours, literally, measuring them, taking pictures, picking them out of the dirt. And in fact, in my computer, I, I tell people, you don't think there's dinosaurs in the church? I got pictures of them, okay? <laughs> it's not a question of did they exist. We know they did. And let me point out to some of the older folks in the room, I think about 50 years ago, we, we kind of did a, a bad thing in that we told our kids one of two things. We either said they were imaginary, which that didn't do us any good, did it? Because then kids went off to museums and they saw them replicas. Or we said, well, you know, maybe God just buried some bones for us to find later on. Okay, last time I checked, God's not the author of confusion, folks. They really did exist. The real question is when? Was it millions and millions of years ago? Or is it possible that they coexisted with man relatively recently? How important is this question to the overall evolution debate? Take a look at this quote. It's from a guy by the name of Philip Kitcher. He he claimed that solid evidence for the coexistence of dinosaurs and humans, look at what he says, would shake the foundations of evolutionary theory because, of course, the dinosaurs are supposed to have been long extinct by the time hominids or early man arrived on the scene. I want everybody in the room to remember what he's saying right here. Solid evidence of humans coexisting with dinosaurs would shake the foundations of evolutionary theory. Because we're going to look at some of that evidence this evening. You see, there is a reason why every time your children pick up something that talks about dinosaurs, they immediately say something like this. No human being's ever seen a live dinosaur. Or, dinosaurs walked on the earth 65 million years ago. What's the truth? Now, before I show you that evidence, I need to give you about a two-minute history lesson. The word dinosaur itself actually came into existence in the year 1845. 
I, I want you to kind of tuck that away right back here. Remember it. A guy by the name of Sir Richard Owen actually coined the term. He, he used two Greek words, dinos, soros, translated by him as fearfully great lizard. You see, it, it, about 20 years earlier, in 1825, a guy by the name of Gideon Mantell, he and his wife, they discovered that a massive tooth, that some of it was too big to be a tooth of anything we were familiar with. They named that long dead creature Iguanodon in 1825. I was in uh, New Zealand not too long ago. Had them take it out of a basically a lockbox in the basement of a museum. It's massive. I mean, there's, there's no doubt if you were to stumble across it, you'd realize, okay, number one, that's definitely a two. But what does it belong to? So 1825, the very first named dinosaur, as far as recent times is concerned, occurred. From 1825 to 1845, more and more of these fossils, teeth started showing up. So that finally, in 1845, Sir Richard Owen, he coined the term dinosaurs. That's really kind of when our, our fascination with these creatures began. And as I mentioned, the question is not did they exist? The real question tonight is when? So let's look at some evidence together. We'll start January 2005 when American researchers very quietly announced that they discovered a dinosaur fossilized in the belly of a mammal. You say, yes, so what, Brad? What's the big deal? Okay, don't forget the evolutionary timeline doesn't have mammals coming into the picture until much, much later. In fact, most of them would say mammals evolved from the dinosaurs and yet you've got a mammal that was eating them. Or maybe we could talk about the find that was discovered just last year, April the 29th. Notice this. It doesn't say fossil. It says actual skin. Meaning literally pliable skin that was discovered from a dinosaur. So well intact that they're now pulling colors from it. Folks, if something's 65 million years old, how do you preserve actual skin. And that's not the only one. We've got soft tissue, for instance. Soft tissue that's so well preserved that they can actually make out individual structures. Now that's pretty cool. But that's far from all of it. Think about this. If we started doing some archaeological digs and we stumble across something like this, a Mesopotamian cylinder seal that looks an awful lot like what you and I would call an Apatosaurus. How did they know what to draw? Or maybe somebody could explain to me these tablets that are attributed to Narmer, the legendary first pharaoh of United Egypt. You see, these are actually real. This is not a, a hypothetical theory that was made up by man. These actually exist. Or maybe you could explain to me the Icostones of Peru. A guy by the name of Dr. Javier Cabrera was given one of these stones as a birthday gift. The, the native farmer there in Peru, he had given them to him. He, Dr. Cabrera looked at the stones. He noticed that they had these elegant carvings on them. So he went back to the farmer. He said, hey, where did you get these? The native told him, he said, ah, oh, these are burial stones that the ancient Incan Indians were placed inside their tombs. Well, Dr. Cabrera set out to find as many of them as he could. He began opening up tombs all across the region. All told, he found about 11,000 of them. Over a third of which have very elegant pictures of dinosaurs. Not just dinosaurs. In some cases, they actually got dinosaurs and men. And in fact, if you look carefully at the lower right, you'll notice you've got a, a guy, he's in Incan garb. What's he doing? He's got a spear. He's hunting it. Or maybe somebody could explain to me. Buddhist temple in Cambodia, uncovered about five short years ago. Folks, this one you can't fake. It, it had been completely covered over in vegetation. They came in with what you and I would call industrial strength roundup. Killed all the vegetation, pulled back the vines. That's when they noticed all these elegant carvings on this temple. 
Like, for instance, this guy right here on the top right, that's a monkey. You'll notice his face, his legs, his back leg, his tail's actually kind of going up behind his head. This guy right here, some of you may have on your wall. It's a deer. You'll see his antlers here, tail in the up position. But the artist didn't just stop with things like monkeys and deers. He also carved things like dinosaurs. So well carved that a 10-year-old child can tell me what kind that is. That's a stegosaurus. Now, here's the interesting thing on this one. I, I'm a guy trained as a scientist. I want first-hand data. Okay? I either want to see it myself or I want somebody who I trust to see it. had a buddy that was going to Cambodia. I said, look, you got to give me some first-hand pictures. So he took these pictures. Here's the interesting thing. He's taking this tour of this 800-year-old Buddhist temple. He's snapping shots. He's getting all these different animals and creatures. He comes up to one of the dinosaur pictures. He's taking pictures. He asked the tour guide, he said, hey, how do you explain this? This is an exact quote, okay? Tour guide looks at him and says, I know what you're thinking, but I'm supposed to tell you it's a porcupine. <laughs> okay, I've seen porcupines before. It's not one of them. Or maybe some of you can explain to me. The dinosaur figurines from Rockabaro, Mexico. Uh, a gentleman, he was riding on the back of a horse. And from that elevated position, he looked down and he found the first of these ceramic figurines. They began to do excavations there at the, the foothills of the El Toro Mountain. And lo and behold, they realized an entire civilization used to be there. They found over 30,000 of these figurines. They decided that they would have them dated. So they sent off little pieces of a, a foot, little pieces of a tail to two labs here in the United States. The University of Pennsylvania and Teledyne Laboratories. Didn't tell them what it was. They simply said, can you date it? They did. Came back with dates of roughly 2000 BC. They sent 18 additional samples to be what's called thermoluminescent testing. That they really wanted to make sure they had this thing right. That came back with dates of 2000 BC. That's when they made their first mistake. Rather than waiting to get it certified in writing, they're on the phone with these guys. They said, hey, you know, the, that material we're sending you, it's coming from dinosaur figurines. After which they got a letter letting them know both labs had withdrawn their results, said we're unable to give you any, any accurate readings on your material. In 1990, they would call it, so to speak. 1990, we sent some dinosaur bone off to the University of Arizona. Didn't tell them what it was. Just simply said, hey, can you date this material? They did. Came back with dates of roughly 9,000 years before present. Now, I grant you it's not precisely 6,000. That's a far cry from 65 million. Or maybe somebody in here can help me understand how do you get a three-toe dinosaur track with a human footprint embedded in it? By the way, this one, verified by CT scan, it's the same layer, folks. Or maybe somebody can explain to me this child's poncho that a buddy of mine, Dennis Swift, discovered in the tomb of about an 11-year-old boy whose mother had embroidered dinosaurs on it. Or maybe you can explain to me the dinosaur petroglyphs in Natural Bridges National Monument. If you were to go there today, just outside of Landing, Utah, there are three of these natural sandstone bridges, one of which is called Kachina. And it's on that particular bridge that the Anasazi Indians, they carved all kinds of things. You can go there today, you can see things like, for instance, bighorn sheep, and you can see things like dinosaurs. In fact, I, I want you to read with me what Fred Barnes had to say regarding this. Keep in mind, Fred Barnes, staunch evolutionist, but he's a, a recognized authority in rock art in the American Southwest. 
He said there's a petroglyph in Natural Bridge National Monument that bears a striking resemblance to a dinosaur. <laughs> My question, why didn't he just call it a dinosaur? Oh, because solid evidence of humans coexisting with dinosaurs would shake the foundations of his theory, folks. For those of you who came in here tonight as skeptics, you'd be happy to know he made that declaration all the way back in 1995. Obviously, that didn't sit very well with evolutionists. So about 18 months ago, they decided they needed to reanalyze. And lo and behold, guess what their experts determined? Their experts determined that every other picture in this bridge was carved by the Anasazi Indians. This one, they said, was made by acid rain. <laughs> Good to know that acid rain can make such pretty curves, right? On this same bridge, they got flying reptiles, pterodactyls, pteranodons that evolutionists would say lived 65 million years ago, back in the, the quote, era of the dinosaurs. Well, that's interesting. Since we've got historians who've seen them. Take a look at the next two slides. They're not the, the prettiest. They don't have the coolest pictures. But when you realize these are from historians, that's a pretty powerful punch. Herodotus, Greek historian, 5th century BC, he said, there's a place in Arabia to which I went on hearing of some winged serpents. And when I arrived there, I saw bones and spines of serpents in such quantities as it would be impossible to describe. He said, the form of the serpent is like that of a water snake. But he has wings without feathers and like as possible to the wings of a bat. All right, so let me get this right. This guy knows the difference between birds, bats, and flying reptiles. Yeah. He's not the only one. Some of you in here are familiar with the name Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian who actually chronicled the death of Jesus Christ at the hands of Pilate. This guy was living when many of the apostles were walking the earth. And he also chronicled seeing flying reptiles. Not just once, but several times in his writing. Or maybe somebody could explain to me this textile from the Museum of Peru, identified as a dinosaur. Or maybe somebody could explain to me the tomb of Richard Bell. If you ever get over to England, let me encourage you. Go up to what's called the Lake District. It's a gorgeous area. For those of you who are uh, Peter Rabbit fans, it's where the author lived. There's a, a little town just on the, the northeast sector called Carlisle. And in that particular town, this cathedral sits. Older than the United States of America. The reason I know that, the tomb of this guy is buried below that carpet. He died in 1496. He's not the oldest one. And then when you go there, by the way, he died in 1496. When did I say the word dinosaur was coined? 1845. So in round numbers, this guy died about 350 years before the word dinosaur was even coined. And when you go there, you have them roll up that carpet, or if you're like me and you have four small children who don't know any better, you have them pull it back. <laughs> you get down on your hands and your knees and you start seeing carved in bronze animals like fish and, and dogs and, and dinosaurs. 350 years before the word came into existence, folks. By the way, it's in the same cathedral built in the 1400s. They've got dragon-like creatures carved into the wood. Here's the thing that most of you don't realize. You go over to Europe, many of their scientific books have dinosaur-like creatures talked about. And yet, ever since Charles Darwin, that's gone away. Or maybe you could explain to me this Mayan base. It's got a, a dinosaur on it. Or maybe these textiles from the Nazca tubes. See, folks, when you really start actually looking at the evidence, we got all kinds of evidence. 
you can literally bounce from continent to continent. We come back to, for instance, the United States. Dr. Samuel Hubbard, curator of the Oakland, California Museum of Science. Dr. Hubbard believed that the American Indians were on this continent much, much longer than we were giving them credit for. So he set out with an expedition down to the Grand Canyon, hoping to find things like the, the pottery, the clothing of Native Americans. Eventually, he made his way down one of the side canyons called the Havai Supai Canyon. And he was right. He, he found his evidence. He, he found their pottery. He found their clothing. But, but he also stumbled across their cave art. You see, etched into those canyon walls, there were images that had taken men literally hours to carve out. You say, all right, Brad, pictures of what? Well, let's see, there was buffalo, sheep, dinosaurs, oxen, men. Run that list by me one more time. Buffalo, sheep, oxen, men, and dinosaurs. In fact, I want you to read with me what Dr. Hubbard had to say regarding his find. He said, take it all in all, the proportions are good. The huge reptile is depicted in the attitude in which man would most likely see it. Reared on its hind legs, balancing with a long tail, either feeding or in a fighting position, possibly defending itself against a party of men. He goes on to say the fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur in the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories regarding the antiquity of man. The fact that the animal is upright, balanced on his tail, would seem to indicate that the prehistoric artist must have seen it alive. Now, I brought a picture of exactly what he saw, and I hate to be the one to tell you guys, that right there is not a sheep. It's not an ox. But it's an awfully good representation of a creature we now know existed called the Edmontosaurus. Folks, how did he know what to call it? He'd never seen that. By the way, for those of you who are kind of trivia buffs, you see this little white dot? That would be a bullet hole from an evolutionist who was trying to get rid of the evidence. Or how about this one? What about soft tissue? How do you get soft tissue in a dinosaur bone? I actually talked to the lady who made this discovery. Her name was Mary Schweitzer. And she shared with me the fact that it was really by accident that they found this. They had a, a T-Rex that they discovered, I believe, in South Dakota. They wanted to get it back to the lab. So they're digging out the bones, putting them in protective material. They rented a helicopter. So the helicopter lands there on the site. <coughs> she said, we're taking the femur, the, the largest bone, trying to get it on this helicopter. They realized it was too big. It literally wouldn't fit. So she said, we realized we we're going to have to cut it. And we cut it right down the middle. She said, when we did that, we could actually turn it and look inside this bone where they found soft tissue, blood vessels, and what she thinks are blood cells. And folks, listen to me. You ask any molecular biologist worth their salt at all, they're going to tell you soft tissue, blood vessels, blood cells, that'll stick around for 65 million years. I asked her the one question that I thought was kind of obvious. I said, why do you think we've never found soft tissue in a dinosaur bone before? Her answer literally sent a chill right up my back. She said, maybe because we've never thought to look. Since her discovery... We found soft tissue in four other dinosaur discoveries. The most recent, you probably heard about, University of California professor, he got fired. Why did he get fired? Because he published in a peer-reviewed journal the fact that he found soft tissue in a dinosaur that supported creation rather than evolution. Folks, we're, we're now literally pulling proteins out of T-Rex bones. And yet, they're still telling our kids these things lived millions of years ago. I mean, literally, all over the world, what we've got is evidence that people saw these creatures. I, I, 
I literally could stand up here for another 15 minutes and just click away showing you slide after slide after slide. But then somebody says, all right, if, if what you're saying is true, Brad, what aren't they mentioned in the Bible? It's not a fair question. The reason I say it's not a fair question, when did I say the word dinosaur was actually coined? 1845. When was your Bible translated into English? 1611. King James Version 6. Okay. How do you get a word in a book that's translated in 1611 when that word doesn't even come along until 1845? A better question for you to ask me is, is there compelling evidence of dinosaur-like creatures in this book? To that, I would say, if you've got a Bible with you tonight, take a look at the book of Job. We, we could actually look at the book of Isaiah. See, I'm so getting used to people whipping out their phones. I'm so used to hearing pages ruffle, but that's good. If you got it on your phone, that's good. Uh, you, you can look at the book of Isaiah. You can look at the book of Psalm. I just love Job. Because folks, you learn a whole lot from Job. Job was a guy who, he lost everything. His character was attacked. He loses his wealth. All of his flocks gone. As they're telling him that, somebody is tapping him on the shoulder saying, Hey, Job, all your kids are gone. Done. told you guys I have four children that would bring me to my knees very quickly if that's not enough this guy has been covered in boils from the crown of his head to the bottom of his feet he's in so much agony take a look at Job chapter 2 his wife comes up to him and she says do you still hold to your integrity curse God and die but he doesn't do that. The reason I say he doesn't do that is because very soon after she made that foolish statement, Job's three friends come on the scene. And, and I put them in parentheses on purpose because they're not really what you and I call friends. What they really are, folks, is nosy. Okay? You may have friends like this. Don't look at them right now. <laughs> These folks assume Job's sin big time. So what do they want to know? What do you do? They're busy bodies. So what you're going to read in your Bible for the next 25 plus chapters is this running dialogue between Job and these three guys. Now obviously I'm paraphrasing, but it kind of goes like this. Eliphaz jumps up and says, Job, wow, man, you need to repent. What you do? Job says, I, I didn't do anything. Friend number two, Bill Dad tags him and says, Ha, come on now, Job. We're your friends. You can tell us what you do. He says, I, I didn't do anything. Friend number three, Zophar, steps up and says, oh, come on now, Job. You've offended God. You, you need to repent. What did you do? Until finally, in, in a fit of anger, Job burst out and he requests to speak to God. In fact, take a look. Job chapter 13, verse 22, he phrases it like this. He says, then you call and I'll answer. You let me speak and you respond to me. He's basically telling God, you go first or I'll go first. It doesn't matter. Well, in Job chapter 38, we have God's response. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. God said, you wanted to talk, big boy? No, we're going to talk, but I'm going to be the one doing all the talking. For the next three chapters, God deluges Job with question after question after question. And folks, I, I don't know, I, I don't really, at this point, I don't care what your religious background is. If you've never read Job chapters 38 through 41, go home and read it. Because it is a humbling piece of text. Basically, here's what God is doing. He's reminding Job, I'm God, you're not. Which, by the way, we could all probably use that reminder occasionally. He says, Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Hey, hey Job, where's the dwelling place of light? Job, you, you see the eagle and the hawk, how do they fly? Or, or what about snow and hail, Job? How do I make those? Or what about the behemoth? 
Job chapter 40, verse 15. Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. He his powers in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. You say, what, what in the world? What's a behemoth? Somebody says, well, Brad, I'm so glad you came to Waterbury because my Bible tells you. I've got a little footnote here. My Bible says it's either an elephant or a hippopotamus. Okay, well, let me very gently remind you, your footnotes are not inspired, okay? I'll go along with you for a minute. Let's look at the description of this creature. It says, well, now strength is in his loins. The force is in the navel of his belly. Obviously, this was a creature with a large stomach, right? Does that guy have a big belly? That guy have a big belly? Yep. That guy have a big belly? Yep. Keep reading. Job chapter 40, verse 17. He moved his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Now, when he's talking about cedars here, it's going to be talking about some of the largest of trees. Say, Brad, how do you know that? Well, we, we do a little word study in the Bible. It turns out it was the cedars of Lebanon used to build the temple, right? These were massive trees. When I teach preaching students, I always try to mentally get them to go to the northwest sector of this country, the redwoods, the sequoias. And yet, here's God. He's describing this creature. He says he moves his tail like a cedar. Not exactly. How about that? Not exactly. It's getting a whole lot closer, isn't it? Somebody says, well, Brad, you, you got a, a little problem there because... Job is a post-flood book. And by that I mean this. We know Job is one of the very first books of the Bible written, but the events of Job actually happened after the flood. Then you don't stand up there and tell us God created man and dinosaurs on day six. Yep. And then we read about this behemoth, this leviathan in the book of Job. Wouldn't that mean... Yep. They had to be on that boat. Now, before you pack me up, put me in a rubber room, give me just a moment to explain. I, I, I go ahead and admit to every single one of you, straight up, I love the flood. Okay? If my wife was, were here, she'd tell you, I could talk on the flood for three hours straight with that. As long as I got a cup of water, I, I love it that much. I went back about a year and a half ago, restudied. There is so much rich material in this account. I, I'll point out to you a couple of obvious things. Number one, don't just think a God who can create the animals can get the dimensions right for how big he needs a boat. But how about this? You ever thought, did Noah have to take adult animals? Could he have taken juveniles? Well, let's see. They eat less food, produce less waste, take up less space. What was the purpose of the animals when they got off the boat? Replenish the earth, right? Does it make sense you'd want to have animals with a long reproductive life ahead of them? Now, I don't mean any disrespect to anybody in the room, but folks, I don't think there was any animals on that boat with an AARP card, okay? I don't think it happened. Ever seen what a dinosaur comes from? An egg, right? Largest dinosaur egg we've ever discovered fit very cleanly in both of my hands. So is it possible God allowed Noah to take juveniles on the boat? Yeah. And as I see it, really, we've only got about one major question left. And that is what happened to him. Before I address that particular question, I am going to share a, a quick funny story with you. If you're from Arkansas, I repent, okay? Don't, don't be in the parking lot. Just and don't look at the people from Arkansas right now. I used to travel uh, all over the world with two things. I would take a, an actual dinosaur egg and one of the actual Icostones. We met the, the Cabrera family. They were generous enough to donate some, some of the Icostones. And it's really cool, you know, you just set them out and let people see them. 
first seeing stuff, you know, you, <coughs> and then 9 11 happened. And all of a sudden, flying became, my wife and I, we called it my weekly massage. You get the pat down, you know, you go through security. And it, it started to be a, a, a rather large headache. I traveled with them in my flight bag every single weekend. So one weekend, I'm coming out of Little Rock. Sure enough, go through security. I get on the other side of the metal detectors. Sure enough, go through security. I get on the other side of the metal detectors, and there's a TSA guy holding both of them. He looks at me real stern. Says, what are these? But I'm thinking, it's not like I'm going to be in the pilot of the dinosaur egg, you know? <laughs> so I, I told him, I said, well, that, that, that's an Ica stone, and that's a dinosaur egg. He looks at the egg, looks at me, looks at the egg, looks at me, looks at the egg, says, so he's still in there? <laughs> Only in Arkansas. <laughs> uh, as I see it, this is the major question left. And, and let me just real quickly tell you, we don't know for sure. I, I would love to be able to, to wrap this lesson up by simply saying, well, you know, all the dinosaurs died out because of blank. But the reality is we don't know. And, and I don't have a problem looking at you saying we don't know. There's a lot of things that humans really don't know. Now we got theories. In fact, I'm aware of about 27 theories of what killed the dinosaurs. I brought five of them with me. The one your kids are going to hear the most about is that asteroid. Of course, that asteroid to me, it, that really poses more questions than it does solutions. Number two is an exploding star flooded the earth with intense radiation. Number three, the Earth's climate became too warm, too cold, too dry, or too wet for the dinosaurs' health. Number four, a change in the dinosaurs' diet resulted in weakened eggshells that broke after being laid. Sad to say, number five really is a scientific theory. A laxative plant, the dinosaurs' diet disappeared, they all died of constipation. <laughs> I will let you decide if that's possible, probable, or pitiful. Do I have a, uh, an answer that I think fits? Yeah, I think I do. Go back in your Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. God's creation is not just declared good, it's actually declared very good. And, and I'll be honest, guys, I've studied it. I don't think anybody in this room, I don't think we get that. You know, as a scientist, I can share with you things like, I know the Sahara Desert, according to the fossils, used to be more of a rainforest. I, I know that buried in the ice of Antarctica, there's fruit trees and palm trees. I know this earth used to be vastly different. And I think in that lush environment, I think they thrived. And then I think about 1,500, 1,600 years later, God rained down his wrath on sin. The flood. Now, we think of it as a flood, you know, 40 days, 40 nights of rain, big deal. This was a, a thing that literally changed the earth. It put in new weather patterns. And I think when those dinosaurs walked off that boat, they looked around, they realized we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> Being large, cold-blooded creatures, they needed lots of vegetation. <clears throat> Suddenly, those little warm-blooded, fuzzy mammals started thriving. And folks, I, I think eventually two things really got them. Please understand, I think the evidence I showed you proves they made it for several thousand years after the flood. But I don't think they thrived again. And here's why. Number one, change in the climate after the flood. Number two, what has man always done to animals we fear? We hunt them, we kill them. Let me share one last little piece of scripture with you to get you thinking before I give you a break. Take a look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 and 30. God said, see, I've given you every green herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth. Every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Prior to the flood, what were both man and animals? According to the text, we were vegetarian. All right, that, that ought to kind of set off a, a light bulb. 
That tells you how we could have coexisted without dinosaurs eating man. We're both vegetarian. It also tells you how you can get all the animals on board the ark without them eating each other. They're all vegetarian. Also tells me how Noah could have gotten the food necessary. They're all vegetarian. It's not until Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, right after the flood, God making his, his promise with Noah that he says, now you can eat meat. So imagine this for just a moment. Imagine 20 years after the flood, okay? <clears throat> Noah walks out and says, boys, go get us something to eat. Shem, Japheth walk out. They, they look over they see a squirrel. For all the young people, squirrel. They see a possum and they see a stegosaurus and they look back over and they think ah oh, that squirrel he's small greasy wouldn't feed everybody that possum will leave him for the people in Arkansas <laughs> we could eat on that guy for weeks <laughs> folks here's what I hope you realize your children are going to have questions about these amazing creatures. And, and at some point in their life, they're going to get the question answered. My question to you is, will you give them the truth, or are you going to let a guy wearing a, a starch white lab coat, a lot of initials after his name, sitting in a college classroom, answer their questions, realizing that the guy delivering the answers has absolutely no belief in a God? Because that will reshape their worldview. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about, okay, if all of this is true, well, what, what about Neanderthal man? Lucy, how, how do they fit in to the picture? Appreciate very, very much y'all's attention thus far. We're going to take about a 10 to 12 minute break, let you get up and stretch your legs, get some snacks. Thanks so much for your attention.